Africa, one of the fastest growing regions in the world. The youngest continent, where six in every 10 people are under 25, with hundreds of different ethnicities and some 2,000 languages. Africa is the most culturally diverse place on Earth. I'm Afwa Hirsch. I've been lucky enough to work across Africa as a journalist. And now I'm exploring Africa's history through its extraordinary creativity and culture. I'm looking at how three very different countries, Ethiopia, Senegal and Kenya, emerged from the shadow of empire in the 20th century and are thriving in the 21st. These African countries are reasserting their identities, gaining new recognition for their role as cultural powerhouses. I'm interested in how that's happened and how the struggles for liberation in the past have helped shape today's African Renaissance. In this episode, Kenya, a country created barely a century ago. Where we are standing here was the bad place for Kenya nation. Where the British spun an idealized stereotype while carving out a brutal empire. And in the works camp, the detainees would make bricks. So they were being forced to build their own prison. Exactly. Where independence created new heroes and icons and an exciting collision of cultures, finding creative ways to respond to the past. As an artist, I think the time for painting beautiful flowers is over. Kenya has come to symbolize the idea of Africa for so many people, but there is so much more to culture here. So many divergent traditions united by a unique political history and by a complicated relationship with the land itself. Here's a vision that we in the West tend to think of as quintessentially Africa. In northern Kenya's Great Rift Valley, the Samburu, an ethnic minority who are a branch of the cattle herding Maasai people, use their bodies as a vivid artistic canvas. The Samburu are semi-nomadic, and so their art is portable, a projection of identity and status that moves through the landscape. Animal blood, tree sap, clays, ash, the very materials and dyes the Samburu use in their body art are rooted in an almost symbiotic relationship with their cattle and the land. The Samburu are always passing through Kenya's imposing landscape. They see themselves as tenants here, but others saw the romantic vastness and wanted to be owners. For centuries, the Kenyan coast witnessed the arrival of adventurers, explorers, missionaries and slavers, all vying for power. But nobody actually tried to plant a flag. It was the arrival of the British at the height of their imperial project who would change all that overnight. The year was 1885. 
the European heads of state had gathered at the Berlin Conference to put some order on the so-called scramble for Africa. Secretly and without consulting any Africans, they divided up this vast continent into spheres of influence. With the stroke of a pen, the East Africa Protectorate threw together indigenous cultures, farming peoples like the Kikuyu, Kamba and Giriyama, fishing people like the Luo, and semi-nomads such as the Maasai and Samburu in a new country commonly known as Kenya, in the British sphere. The first big British project, a 600-mile railway, snaking inland from the coast to open up Central Africa to trade, to transport colonial officials, troops and resources. was more than just a railway. This was a piece of strategic power play, so audacious, so costly, that at the time, it hardly seemed possible. More than any other single event, this railway established British control over the land and created the state of Kenya, setting this country on a path from which there'd been no turning back. Work began in 1896, but disaster immediately struck. Dozens of the Indian workers brought over to build the railway were eaten by lions. British MPs, outraged by the costs and excesses, nicknamed the project the Lunatic Line. Four workers died for each mile of railway that was constructed. This was a hugely costly project, one which mostly British people didn't have to make the sacrifice for. Sir Charles Elliot, the commissioner who presided over the project, quipped, it is not uncommon for a country to create a railway, but it is uncommon for a railway to create a country. But not everyone was thrilled by the creation of the new country. Some Kenyans found ingenious ways to unite and resist the encroaching power. This is the Kifudu dance, being performed today to keep alive the memory of Mekatalili Wamenza, a resistance fighter against British rule. Mekatalili inspires contemporary artists and her people to this day. Mekatalili was from the Giriyama people, who live predominantly along Kenya's coast. A widow, she had lost brothers to the Arab slave trade and was suspicious when in 1913 the British tried to recruit Giriyama men into work in plantations or the army. One day, there was a public meeting where we are standing here. The British administrative officer then, Arthur Champion, came here with his translator, he was called Wanja Wamugaya. And when you say here, you mean right Just where here we are this standing. Spot. Yeah, on this spot we are standing. Arthur Champion said, I want your boys to join the British Army. And she told Wanja Wamugaya, the interpreter, can you tell your boss to take one of those siblings of that hand? He walked in there and took one of those, uh, those six, and you can imagine, the mother hand reacted very furiously. And he took his pistol and killed the mother hen. Mekatilil also understood what that meant. And she slapped Arthur Champion to the ground. She slapped? Uh, yes, the physically, physically slapping. And uh, Arthur Champion went down. And now, this is a man who's armed with a gun? Yes. 
So what did they do? One of them just pulled the trigger and killed one of the German men. When he did that, the war started. Mecca Talili traveled across the country to galvanize a resistance, gathering people by performing the funeral Kifudu dance. After the dance, Mekatili would then preach to them. You say, we have a disaster here. People have come here. They are taking our land. They are taking our children. We don't want them here. Where we are standing here was the bad place for Kenya nation. Mecca Talili has become a folk hero, a Giriyama David against the British Goliath. Without money or weapons, with her people dispersed, she took the thing that united them, their culture, and weaponized it for her cause. The British responded by twice exiling Mecca Talili, confiscating Giriyama lands killing around 150 people and burning 5,000 homes. Slowly but surely, they tightened their grip on their new possession. And what a possession it was. To the British, a space more than twice the size of their homeland, with wild savannah and mountains of eerie beauty packed with exotic wildlife. They saw the opportunity for a white settler colony. Their idea was to use the newly finished Lunatic Line Railway to encourage British farming of the central mountain plains of Kenya, the area with the most fertile land, coolest climate, and with a plentiful supply of Africans who could be turned into farm hands. The area became known as the White Highlands. The white settlers were invariably drawn from Britain's aristocracy and landed gentry, people who felt they knew a thing or two about running large estates and who had the money to invest in them. And they also brought with them intense ideas about British culture and civilization, ideas that took on a new dimension in this landscape. But thousands of miles away from the rigid norms of Edwardian Britain, they regarded this as a place that was kind of an Eden, uninhabited and wild the perfect setting for adventure and freedom. This white romantic vision of Kenya has had enormous resonance and staying power. It's been projected across the world in literature, film and television. And by one book in particular. I had a farm in Africa at the foot of the Ngong Hills. The equator runs across these highlands, 100 miles to the north, and the farm lay at an altitude of over 6,000 feet. In 1937, a Danish baroness called Karen Blixen published a memoir about her life on her family's coffee farm near Nairobi. She called it Out of Africa. The book documents the attitudes of the upper crust of colonial Kenya, who became known as the Happy Valley Set, the tabloid fodder of the interwar years. It also traces a love affair based on the real-life fling Karen had with the Englishman Dennis Finch Hatton. The geographical position and the height of the land combined to create a landscape that had not its like in all the world. The views were immensely wide. Everything you saw made for greatness and freedom, an unequalled nobility. That book has done so much to promote an image of Kenya as a blank landscape, a primordial, 
canvas onto which the white nobility, privileged people come to fulfill adventure and romance. And the role of Africans in this narrative is minimal. They've simply existed as accessories to that central white adventure. Safari culture had been ushered in by the lunatic line. Among early pith-helmeted hunters, with their tall stories and trophies, was American President Teddy Roosevelt in 1910. But it was after the 1940s and the establishment of Kenya's vast national parks that Safari's promise of adventure and sighting big game fueled large-scale tourism. And the tourism, in turn, transformed Kenyan art. Typical Nairobi craft market. This is where you find the most popular Kenyan art, vibrant celebrations of the country's wilderness and safari animals. Being in this craft market in Nairobi is a little bit like being inside the mind of a tourist idea of what African culture is. Even though the people who work here work so hard and there is great skill, I can't help but feeling that they're often giving tourists what they want. Things that feed into their preconceptions of images of giraffes, zebras, wooden carvings that don't have any actual recognizable tradition but kind of conform to that vague idea of a mask. And then tourists come here and buy that stuff and feel like their worldview has been vindicated. You know this? This is a giraffe. The expert wood carvers here are largely from the Kamba people, who make up a tenth of Kenya's population. The Kamba art movement began in the early 20th century and invented what some call a colonial modernist style that has been eagerly embraced by the tourist market. How are you? Uh, we make animals, wild, wild animals. Uh, here in Kenya, we have a national park, we have giraffe. So they see a big giraffe. After there, they go and see a big elephant. After that, there, there is a rhino and cheetah. That's the most tourist things which they like it. <laughs> we can make anything. But because of our mind, we are put it there. Tourism likes animals. <laughs> <laughs> You're from an ethnic group that has a tradition of carving. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell me about that and how did you come to be so good at making things from wood? Mm, that's not something which I know because that is my grand, my grand, my grand, my grandfather. When we were colonized, he tries to go somewhere when he was naked, no clothes. So he tries to find his head, what am I going to close my, my body? What am I going to make? I make a shirt from wood. From wood? Yeah. A wooden shirt? Yeah, just to make like this one. Okay. He closed here and he make another <laughs> thing to close there. You know, so he was, so that he can move oh. because of the colonizer people. That's so because, where... because Europeans came, he yeah. didn't want to be naked anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Highly skilled and popular, these camber carvers make money from tourists and art about the land at the same time. To the east, near Kenya's coast, wood carvings are literally rooted into the land for a deeper purpose. The Giriyama people's villages are based around sacred forests called Kaya. They believe they're filled with the spirits of their ancestors, marked by carved posts that look like human statues, called Vigango. Vigango are designed to represent the dead. 
commissioned by the family after a relative dies, they're interred into the ground during the funeral ceremonies to make sure the deceased is welcomed into the ancestral world. It's a marriage between art and spirituality, planted in the landscape itself. The Vagango you can see taking shape behind me is more than just a headstone or a representation. It's the living embodiment of the spirit of an ancestor who has died. And as long as the Vagango remains in the ground here, it anchors that spirit to their home. The Vagango is nearly finished now, and the villagers are using red ochre to paint the body and charcoal to mark the eyes and the eyebrows on the face. Really just putting those finishing human touches so that it looks like the person that it is. It's a law of traditional or oh, 100 years ago culture. Is the spirit of your ancestor in the Kigango? Yeah. What is the purpose of the Kigango? To keep a respectful of him. And uh, it's a sort of magnet to pull things, to bring good things to you. You do it, you go for him, and he release good things mm -hmm. to approach you. When you made the Vigango, did good things happen? When I put that Kigango, after six months, I, beat, I managed to build this house because my work, herbal treatment, it was paying well, well. So it brought you prosperity? Yeah. So it really changed your life? I changed. Sometimes these traditions have brought the wrong kind of attention. Unfortunately for the Giriyama, over decades, thieves and unscrupulous dealers have targeted Vigango, uprooting them to be sold to Kenya's booming tourist market. Only now are some Vigango being successfully repatriated from the private collections and public museums where they've ended up all over the world. If somebody came and took this Kigango away to sell it, what do you think would happen to the person? If a person who is a thief, a great thief, to come and steal, very, very, very simple. Just you come here, just put as a, as a cassava, you carry it there and you are in for it. You are in, you won't escape. You won't escape. You die or become mad. Do you think this Kiganga will be here for a long time? If I'll pass through and it will remain here, for a century. Even your granddaughter will come and sit here if we're still alive. There's been a real trade in Vigangos over the past century or so, and I can see why people value them. But when you understand what they mean in this culture, they're so much more than an interesting piece of art. They're inhabited by the spirit of an ancestor, and their purpose is to anchor that spirit to their home here. So the idea of taking them away and trading them for money is a violation of everything that they represent. Back in the 1950s, Kenyan resistance to the violations of colonialism was mounting. The Kikuyu people were most affected by the White Highlands project. And after World War II, as a new wave of anti-colonialism swept across Africa, their frustration boiled over. The Mau Mau was a secret society of Kikuyu who took an oath to attack European settlers. In 1952, the British authorities declared a state of emergency. Years of bitter guerrilla war followed. Hundreds of thousands of Kikuyu were detained or curfewed. Tayana 
Anna Chow is part of a younger generation of Kenyan historians documenting the internment sites that still survive. So the buildings we see here are, they were used as cells to um, keep detainees. You can see barbed wire on the roof. Gosh. And you'll notice in some of the buildings you have a carving on the bricks that says MWC, but that means Moeru Wax Camp. And in the wax camp, the detainees would make bricks that would either be sold or used to build the structures. Gosh. So, so they were being forced to build their own prison. Exactly. So you notice that um, the room we're in has windows, mm -hmm. but when this was a cell, there was no light coming in. So the school has basically carved out the windows from the brick itself. How many Mau Mau do you think would have been living in a in a space like this? From our research sources and our con conversations with veterans, we estimate maybe 60 people. 60? 60 In people. this space? In this tiny space. This is a torture chamber. A torture Basically, chamber for the camp? You'd be kept here alone mm. with very little food and very little water for a period of a number of days, extent. I don't know if you can see it now, but they would put water, they would fill the room with water and you couldn't sit or sleep. Oh, so you just have to stand. That's horrific. Do people still feel critical of Mau Mau? Because there was a level of violence involved. Everyone selectively chooses what they want to remember and what they don't want to remember. And you have very many factions that say that Mau Mau was, um, they were savages and they killed people. You have some that say they fought for independence. You have some that say um, that they gave us Kenya as we know it today. People who were part of Mau Mau, who fought alongside them or who suffered because they were deemed Mau Mau, were the sacrifices they made respected and remembered once Kenya gained independence? A lot of them left detention just to find out that uh, their land had been taken the ancestral land, so they didn't have any land. Um, they had to buy back land from the chiefs or the loyalists who were put in place by the colonial government. Their families had separated. Some of their parents or their siblings had died. So they came out of detention, I think both physically and mentally in a very deprived state, which continued into onto independence. So it was either you abandon Mau Mau or you, or you just wither, wither away, yeah. The Mau Mau insurgency was the beginning of the end for British rule in Kenya. Jomo Kenyatta, a Kikuyu who'd been imprisoned by the British on trumped up charges of being a Mau Mau leader, led Kenya to independence in 1963. Articulate, charismatic, and larger than life, Kenyatta managed to turn this most British of colonies into a successful, independent African nation. Nothing better expressed Kenyatta's infectiously optimistic vision than new architecture. A major contribution to that modernist wave was this building in central Nairobi. It was built by the first president of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta, who, in a not uncharacteristic case of showboating, named it after himself, the Jomo Kenyatta International Conference Center, built as a headquarters for his political party. With its cylindrical tower rising above Nairobi at 32 stories, it was by far the tallest structure in East Africa right up until the late 1990s. Inside, it has a magnificent auditorium shaped like a traditional dwelling. The design was by a Norwegian, Carl Henrik Nosvik, but it's a building particularly suited to the tropical Kenyan climate. A bold use of concrete in airy, open galleries and terraces, without the windows and insulation you need in Scandinavia. In African buildings like this, modernism was set free. 
I feel like there are so many stereotypes and cliches about African cities, and this building is just one of so many examples, albeit a very impressive one, of how Africans decades ago were already thinking in big, ambitious, modernist terms about the future, and using architecture like this to realize that vision. As the city grew after independence, workers from across the continent brought with them different styles and ways of playing music. Benga fused these styles. A hybrid of rumba from the Congo and the folk songs of the Luo people from Western Kenya. In the 1960s and 70s, it quickly became the unifying soundtrack of the city. It's a very big band, so when we do practice, everybody contributes. Like you come with a song and then everybody contributes. So what's your role? My role, I, I sing. And is there usually one singer or more than one singer in a Benga band? We are many singers. Now how are the vocals in Benga? Very sweet. <laughs> yeah. It teaches uh, people about living with one another in peace, you know, and it teaches about day-to-day -day life and love, mostly. Very important. Yes. <laughs> Is it something to do with the city and the way people go to work and they want to relax that, that help Benga thrive? It is. It is, because if you see around the people who are here, we have doctors here, we have lecturers here, and then after they come from work, they want to, you know, to chill their, their mind, so they come here, and when we play music, they go home, they feel better. You can come here when you're very stressful, and when we play, like, one, two, three songs, you go home when you're happy and smiling, you know. Benger embodies the energy and excitement of the decade after independence. Saturday night at this pub in Western Nairobi is Benga night. People believe Benga died a long time ago. Our fathers and uh, grandfathers, we used to do Benga. But tonight, if you go around Nairobi, you'll find every club is playing live band. It's Saturday it night, Benga, yeah. so you're not going to go, uh, go anywhere. No, no, we are not going anywhere soon. We are there to stay. The excitement for the future embodied in Benga spilled out onto Nairobi's streets and found expression in a very distinctive form. Like London's red buses or New York's yellow taxis, Nairobi's minibuses have become an icon of the city's visual culture. They're known as Matatu, Swahili for three, after the original three-pence fare of the 1960s. Matatus are the way most of Nairobi's four and a half million people get around. Congestion is a challenge in the city. Many commuters spend hours in Matatus every day. Given that Nairobians spend so much time waiting for or sitting in Matatu, perhaps it's no surprise that they've eventually become part of the city's identity, unofficial Nairobi mascots. They're brash, chaotic, noisy, but they also have free Wi-Fi. They're entrepreneurial and full of life. Today, Matatus are an unlikely outlet for creativity. If you think about it, 
The tattoos are really Nairobi's most visible version of street art. It's just that in this case, the canvas is always on the move, transporting its ideas and images round and round the city. Dennis Muraguri is one of Kenya's leading contemporary artists. He depicts the chaotic beauty of Nairobi's street life through mixed media prints and paintings. I can see your obsession with matatis. They're everywhere in your workshop, even on your clothes. Yeah. <laughs> what is the obsession with matatis? I just grew up loving matatus. And uh, some, I grew up next to a bus park. They are more than just a vehicle that takes you from point A to B. They are kind of concept boxes. So you find matatus with, uh, they, they have, they, they try to outdo each other with, with some ridiculous paint jobs and plasma screens, loud music, performances by the operators. You could say that the matatu experience encapsulates a lot of the challenges of life here, sitting in traffic, not being able to guarantee your safety, a level of chaos and noise. Yeah. So you're deliberately so, countering uh, yeah. all of that negativity yeah. by actually actively yeah. celebrating the good parts. Yeah. Matatu without passengers and operators is just a shell. It becomes alive when they, people come into it. That's the most beautiful thing about them. Economic migrants arrived from around the country. Nairobi's growth created new challenges. Today, as many as two and a half million people live in slums like this across Nairobi, almost two thirds of the city's total population, but on just a tiny fraction of the land. I feel like I'm giving you your obligatory slum scene. And to be quite honest, I'm frustrated with the fact that depictions of places like this that don't really get to the bottom of what life here is like are still such a prevalent way of depicting African countries like Kenya. This is a difficult place to live. There are challenges here, there's poverty, but it's so much more complicated than that. There is so much more going on here. There is such an order to life here that you can't really understand just by looking at tin shacks or rubbish dumps. And one of the things that's going on in areas like this is a really interesting creative scene that's often not what you would expect. ballet has become a source of self-expression for children living in Kibera, the largest urban slum in Africa, home, it's believed, to over a million people. Joseph Kanyenje is one of their teachers. Point your feet. Were you surprised that people in Kibera take so well to ballet? At first. At first, I had a perception in my head when I was told, oh, you're coming to work, you're going to work in Kibera. I was like, oh, God. But then when I saw how they're moving, I was like, oh, it's just, there's no difference from here and other, other places that are, ha have an interaction with the children. My perception was changed immediately. It is quite a noisy, chaotic oh. area, but it's as if in this room you yes. created a very orderly ballet studio. I'm surprised how the girls, the girls are the ones actually who calms me down. Because for me, I can't, I can't deal with the noise. But the girls, just like... They're not phased. Yeah. <laughs> do they face hardship? Of course they do have their own hardship. But you never see it. They're always happy. They're always coming to school and see them chatting around. You see them when you ask them, how do you say that the Kibera is a nice place? It is a nice place, it, is, it really is. This ballet is a reminder that the narrative of Africans in destitution and in need of handouts 
is outdated and unhelpful. There's a real resilience in the face of adversity here. Exploring even further beyond the cliché, we find the very material of the slum inspiring a whole new art movement. Meshak Oyero is one of a new generation of artists producing recycled art. A sculptor, he works to upcycle the junk the slums produce and turn it into something positive. I have to say, it's a little bit hard to see. At the moment, this part of rubbish is kind of covered in flies, quite grimy. I can't immediately imagine its potential. As you know, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> so I see beauty in there. And what gave you the idea to do it? As a young artist, coming up with the money to buy materials and not being sure of the market, it was quite challenging. So that's why I turned into recycling. Is there an ideological dimension to using recycled material as well? Are you making a bigger point about the environment? Yeah, definitely, because like I'm upcycling what has already been, been thrown away and trashed. So I'm trying to give it another life. How do you pick one chain from another? They're slightly different colors, lengths? Different chains make different pieces. There are pieces where I want really smaller chains, like, like these ones are small and you can see they have like some beauty in them. This particular one, I work with the, when I'm doing maybe a face or a, or a tiny piece. And then the other pieces where I have to use, to use fat chains That's like this. a lot this. chunkier. Yeah, a lot chunkier. So this particular one I can use when I'm making maybe the body and uh, I need to cover lots of bulks. I will easily use this one when I'm like making a quite a humongous piece. Okay. Yeah, because mostly I need to cover all the blank spaces around. You see this kind of piece? It's, it's aluminium, mm. but also the aesthetic in it is quite mm. beautiful. I really can't wait to see what you're going to do with all this stuff. <laughs> Intriguingly, despite the innovation with materials, Meshak reworks a familiar and abiding Kenyan theme, the call of the wild. They say charity begins at home, so my first audience where I would like the message to go to are my fellow countrymen. And then out there, because out there is just a plus now, but this is our doorstep, so. If it's well here, then I'm happy with that. Meshak is one of hundreds of artists in Africa's burgeoning recycled movement. Using their startling inventiveness to repurpose found material and create both powerful art and an ecological rebuke. African recycled art now has a global reach Today, Kenya finds itself in an exciting moment of transition. With a dynamic, young population, responding with huge creativity to the challenges of urban life, Nairobi buzzes with energy and expression. Michael Soy is the leading artist here, documenting Kenya's journey. His bold, colourful style holds up a satirical mirror to Kenyan society and politics, and has brought him worldwide attention. This is your studio. Michael. This is my studio. You have a really distinctive style, very accessible. It really hits you, and your messages are, are there to see. 
What I try to do is make it as simple as possible to a point where if you stand there and don't get it, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> make it as simple as possible. I mean, yes. tell me about this one. This is, a... <clears throat> this is a piece I did last year after the election. Mm. There's a lot of Kenyans who were killed by policemen because people contested the results of the election. All the people who were killed all came from the same region. So you've depicted so, bullet holes yes, bleeding the, from that part the of bullet it. holes and then the lines that you see are actually names of the people who died. Wow. So this is a name of this person who was killed either in Western Kenya or in the slums in Kibir. Michael is painting a series he calls China Loves Africa, questioning the growth of Chinese power in this region and asking again who owns the land. In Kenya, the Chinese loaned $3.6 billion for a new railway line running alongside the old lunatic line as part of its Belt and Road initiative. Many, like Michael, worry about the debt trap in which Kenya now finds itself. I haven't seen that many artists in African countries where China is now so heavily involved. Yes. Critiquing it in their painting. First of all, it is not a critic. Um, really? A lot of people think that I am criticizing, but it is not a critic. The question now that everybody needs to ask themselves, how did China find itself in Africa? China was invited to come into Africa. By who? By the Africans themselves. If I talk about this particular piece, you know, all these men, you will realize some of them are very fat. You understand? But you've also infantilized them. You've put them in their underpants. Yes. They look dependent now. The reason why I make them fat is because the people who are benefiting from the generosity or generosity of China are not the ordinary people, it's the politicians. When you hear of the railway, people connected in government will go and buy their land from the peasant farmers for nothing, for next to nothing, like $100 per acre. And when the railway was proposed, they now sold the land back to government for like 100 times worth what they bought it for. The people who are suffering are the people, are the citizens who are going to like, you know, be paying some of these loans. If you have a 10 year old kid right now, by the time they're 20, 25, they still be servicing uh, the loans that we got to build the railway to Mombasa. Me, I will not blame China. China is doing what it feels is its own interest. Is this potentially though the new imperialism? It's more subtle. It's potentially even more long lasting and, and definitely omnipresent. No, I think the British came with the Bible first and managed to convince everybody. And then the guys with the guns came later. The Chinese are coming with money, you know, and you know, when you have a continent that consistently thinks that we are poor, we are poor, we are poor, we are poor, and come and offer money, then trust me, you will get into whatever corner of the country you want. As an artist, I think the time for painting beautiful flowers is over, you know? I try to do a lot of work that revolves around social issues, things that affect the normal Kenyan on a day-to-day -day basis. So I am documenting certain moments, maybe probably for posterity. A kid sitting in a classroom in 40, 50 years time from now can get a book, look at it, and kind of like get an impression of what Nairobi was like back then. Kenya has attracted outsiders too often for the wrong reasons. Oh, Africa. Get them more Africa. Brutal imperial schemes have dispossessed the people while contorting their story into a cliché that shaped perceptions not just of this country, but of the whole African continent. Yet here, I found a population and dynamic art scene channeling a creative renaissance and frankly embodying hope amid the legacies of a dark history a new vision for the future that breaks through old cliches.